Let's give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Bill Bowling. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to stand back here just to begin with or hold this up because I, I asked my staff, because um, I know we have a lot of folks at Georgia Tech that are involved at the food bank, and I just wanted to share some of those numbers. You know, we're about a mile from here right off of Northside Drive um, near um, uh, Joseph Lowry Boulevard. Uh, so very close by. Um, Georgia Tech, and let me start out by saying there are, I think, 28 colleges and universities in the Atlanta area. Could be more. Georgia Tech provides more volunteers than any other college or university in the metro Atlanta area. Last year we provided 1,646 hours of volunteer time. Now we use over a thousand volunteers a month, so that's no small thing. So give yourself a hand to start out with. <laughs> Circle K, Alpha Tau Omega, Lamba Chai, Language Institute. You were the volunteer uh, group of the year in 08 and 09. I'm really just recruiting all of you guys if you hadn't been volunteering at the food bank to come on over. I um, also wanted to say that I taught in the School of Management School many, many years ago. I think you guys were in about the third grade then. But um, I taught a semester here and really taught uh, as graduate students talking about management and social responsibility. So I'm going to hit on some of those themes today uh, about if you're going to go out and be a leader and be a manager in the community, the, I think the value of, uh, of being involved in community. Uh, Georgia Tech employees, people that work at Georgia Tech, both the professors and the professional staff, also gave the most money through the state system to the food bank. Um, and lastly, I have a group through the School for Industrial and Systems Engineering graduate students who are working with me this semester and their assignment they get graded on saving me a hundred thousand dollars this semester so uh, if they come through we're all going to be good so that's the way I wanted to start is to just thank Georgia Tech it's been a, uh, a great relationship through the years uh, both with graduate students with volunteers with donations uh, and ways that we work together now Theron said, I came to Atlanta in 1974 to go to graduate school. Originally from North Carolina, grew up in a small town of about 800 people, had never lived in a city before. In fact, didn't plan on living and staying here in Atlanta. I was going back to live in western North Carolina. Uh, but having come here for graduate school, um, I found a call to serve. Now, I was not voted the most likely to succeed in high school. In fact, I barely got out of high school. I joined the service when I was 17. Uh, I spent four years in the Air Force, spent about two years in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, uh, and came back from that pretty scarred like we all do if we go into war that, at that young age, uh, but knew that um, I wanted to go to school. I was the first one in my family to ever go to college. So I didn't have a lot of role models, but I did have a lot of expectation on me that, that uh, having gone through the service that uh, the GI Bill would pay for my college, and they did. So I went to business school and got a degree in business administration. Uh, and then I went on and got a degree to teach business in community colleges. It was a specialized degree in North Carolina. But by that time, I didn't really believe in business. Okay? This is the late 60s, early 70s. This is uh, you know, when your parents were young people my age. And there was a lot going on in the country. I was that uh, kid, even back in middle school and high school, that always asked why and why not, even in inappropriate times. Uh, never was very endearing when I asked those questions. But they served me well 
as I went on to graduate school, I studied psychology and counseling. And by that time in my life was really focused on uh, my spiritual life and what I wanted to do. And I had no idea. I often tell kids in undergraduate school, you know, keep staying in school till it, it kind of rises up in you. For myself, I used to come to Atlanta. This is 1974. I'd always get lost when I came into town. But I used to go down to the King Center. Actually, there was no King Center back then. There was just the tomb, a picket fence beside the tree that King played on right beside Ebenezer Baptist Church, and gravel. It wasn't even paved. So this was long before they raised the money and created a center. And you know, Now I think it's the second most visited national park in the country. I used to go and circumvent the grave. And the question I was asking myself, and I was just very seriously asking, you know, I'm 25, 26 years old by now. Hadn't gotten married, hadn't gotten a real job. My parents are getting pretty worried about me by now, you know. Are you going to settle into anything? The question I asked myself was what was I willing to die for? Just as Dr. King had given his life and inspired me, I asked that question of myself. What am I willing to die for? And still did not get answers. So I came to Atlanta and started a community down on 10th Street and started working with the homeless and Vietnam veterans. I give you this story because a lot of times you don't know in middle school, high school, college, sometimes even in your 30s exactly what it is that you want to really devote your life to. So that discernment process and that questioning, I think, is very important. So in starting a, a community of people, we took in homeless and mentally ill people in our home. We started feeding people down in uh, Piedmont Park. We were across the street back then. Not having any institutional support and really no money, uh, I ended up volunteering at a downtown church, St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And this is 1975 now. So very soon, I was the lead volunteer. And within a year, I had the director of community ministries, a new position at the church. And what I knew at that point was I love to make soup. I love to work with volunteers. I love to serve people. Just as simple as that. Again, had no idea that it would turn into a career that I would be managing anything other than, you know, serving several hundred people a day. But after a couple of years in the community kitchen, we were up to three and four hundred people a day. And we were having to feed about 75 people at a time. And then get those out and bring 75 more people in. And I realized this was really not conducive for transformational work, for ministry. So I went all over town and asked congregations, churches of all sizes, shapes, black and white, all denominations, all faith groups, and I promised them all the food they needed if they would open their doors to the homeless, thinking maybe one of them would have a conversation with me. A lot of them responded. And the only problem was at that point is I didn't have any food. And I didn't even have a program. I just went out and said, you know, we can do this. So having got a positive response, I thought, I've got to go do it now. I make that point because that's one way to begin a business. You go out and promise people you're going to deliver a product and then go back and have to deliver the product. It's kind of stressful that way. It's better to plan ahead. But um, it, it worked at that point. So they gave me the basement of the church was a room about this big, no loading dock, no offices. It was just a, you know, about a 120-year-old building. But I started a food bank, and it was an idea that was going on in about 10 cities in the country. I didn't know any of those folks, never heard of the term food bank. We were just starting one here. Then soon found out that there were about a dozen of us, and we met, and we created an organization called Feeding America back in 1979. First thing I did, because I'm going to have to produce some food, 
is I went to the food industry, I went to the grocery store chain here, it was owned by a family back then, the Alterman family. I went to them and I uh, gave them my big idea, said how sincere I was and how much I really wanted to help most needy people in the community. They just kicked me right out of the office. They said, we don't give away food, we're selling food. That's what our, our business model is to sell food. First lesson for me, I had to learn the business of the people that I wanted to help me. So I had to learn what are the issues or the stresses in the grocery business where I could be part of their business model. I had to offer them a business proposition not just go to them with a moral issue. I mean, they could say they could give to United Way or have their employees volunteer, but they weren't going to give me product unless I could help them. So the beginning of the food bank was me learning the grocery business. It was me learning their big stress is how do we control our inventory. We've got 100 stores around the city, and they make a mistake in the grocery store. They could throw it in the dumpster and they'd never know in the main office for weeks or months. So the first thing we did was figure out how could we track that product. Anything that was donated to me, I had to inventory and have them hand them an inventory slip back and say, each store, I could tell you how much product you're not selling. So I had a business proposition, right? All right, I need you guys to answer a little bit. You with me? So in any nonprofit or any business that you're in, for-profit or non, not for profit, you need to figure out what the rules are in that business. And you had to figure out a business proposition where you're creating a one win-win sustainable relationship over time. So the model of the food bank is to collect unmarketable product and distribute it to community-based organizations. I started out with about 30 organizations and about 4,000 square feet. I had a pickup truck that had been taken off the road at Georgia Power, and, and uh, you know they were discarding it, and that's how I began. And again, I thought, you know, I'll spend a year or so doing this, kind of learning it, and then move on to the next thing. But if anything happened, in the meantime, I really liked the business and I really liked the people we were serving. So the idea is that a congregation or a nonprofit organization can come to the food bank and get whatever product we had donated. Now shift 31 years later. In Aaron's introduction, he mentioned a 129,000 square foot facility, and I also have a 60,000 square foot. So I have about, uh, you know, 150,000, almost 200,000 square feet of warehouse space today. Started with four, have almost 200 today. And what's happened through the years is we have created our capacity. We've created a capacity to work with different constituencies and different parts of the community. Let me mention a couple of programs that we work with and why we got in those and then maybe some of the qualities that I found are important uh, to be successful. Any good business today, any good business today is going to be mission-centered, for-profit or not-for-profit. You're going to have a mission or uh, some type of principles or something that you measure everything against. So at the food bank, there's nothing in our mission about trucks. I have about 15, 16, 17 trucks out on the road every day. We'll handle about 28, 29, 30 million pounds of food this year. There's nothing in my mission about trucks and warehouses and agencies. The mission at the food bank is to engage, educate, and empower the community to fight hunger. To engage, educate, and empower the community to fight hunger. So my mission is not about the mechanics, it's about how do I get the community involved in what we do. Now we'll have some Q&A later, but you could take any business and we could break it down and they're going to figure out who their constituency or who their customers are and they're going to figure out a way to measure that, 
of whether they're doing a good job, figure out the metrics. So we've created a number of programs at the food bank. Our core business is to collect and distribute food products. So everything else we do is based on that core business. If we don't do well with our core business, none of the other programs are going to do well. We are able to measure, for instance, the return on investment at the food bank. We have about a $16.5 million budget. We have about 120 full-time staff people that work there now. We use over 1,000 volunteers every month, which is worth about 28 staff people. I don't have to pay. They're doing real-time work. So the return on the investment at the food bank is every dollar someone would invest in the food bank. And in our case, since we are a bank, we use banking terms. We talk about return on investment. I don't want you to give me money. I don't even want you to donate money. I want you to invest in our work. So the investment at the food bank pays off. We get about $2 and eight, I mean $7.80 worth of food out the door for every dollar that people invest in the food bank. Good return on investment. And if you're going to the community today, you can, you can make the moral argument it's the right thing to do. But what people are looking at now with more to do and less money and a lot of cynicism about who to trust, you've got to show people what's going to happen if they invest in you. What good is going to happen out there in the community. So core business, Dollar equals seven dollars and eighty cents worth of work. As we started thinking about who are the partners we're going to need out there, we first thought a great partner in the Atlanta community is the hospitality industry. Okay, they, they we're a big hospitality town, a big convention town. Better to have them on your side and us to be the charity of choice than uh, than them not know who we are or not care about hungry people. One of the things for them is if there's homeless people out there on the street, it's not good for business. So we had a conversation right away. But we started a program called Atlanta's Table. That was a program where we pick up catered food or food from restaurants or food from hotels or food from the World Congress Center. It's already been cooked. And we pick it up and deliver it the same day to agencies ready to eat. Just like out of your refrigerator, you might have made it this morning, going to eat it tonight or eat it the next day. But to get that done, we had to deal with issues of what happened if somebody gets sick, liability issues. What about the, the logistics? What about how are you going to judiciously handle this? What's going to happen to our reputation if somebody finds out something went wrong? What's the health department going to stay? So anytime you approach a partner that way, you've got to figure out, just like I did with the grocery store, what are your issues. In this case, we actually got a law passed, the Good Samaritan Food Bill, which has now been passed by Congress. It's a national law, but we got the first one passed here in Georgia. It said that the donor, if he donates to the food bank, is released of liability. So no matter what happens to that food, now where does the liability go? I take the liability. Okay. I've got insurance. Hopefully I've got God on my side, and mostly we really watch what we do. We judiciously handle the food. But somebody's got to accept it, and you've got to take it off that donor. The donor has deep pockets. We don't. So Atlanta's table became the charity of choice for the hospitality industry. In fact, we got UPS to invest in the model, and we created a whole national network out of the Atlanta Food Bank called Food Chain. We created about 125, a Seattle table, a Dallas table, and created about 125 of these around the country. And they eventually merged into Second Harvest, which is now called Feeding America. That's our national network of food banks. So today there are 203 food banks. We have seven of them here in Georgia. Uh, and we collaborate, we share product with each other, we share best practices. And we particularly share when we have problems, how do we solve them. So another program that we started was community gardening. We built over 140 community gardens. Now who's the constituency for community gardens? You think about it. Atlanta's table, it was the hospitality industry. Community gardens, who would be interested in that? 
Huh? Well, usually, well, urban farmers, people that are growing gardens, but community gardens are where a group of people come together and all have a plot. Okay? So we have community gardens in congregational yards. We've got gardens in schools as teaching gardens. We've got, uh, with 140 of them, we've got them all over the city. Looks like a really cool idea today because food costs are high. Food costs are going to go up with fuel prices going up. You know, so everybody's wanting to do gardening. But I can tell you, you know, 20 some years ago, uh, it, it was kind of a new idea. But the constituency there is neighborhoods and people living at the community level. So each program that I'm talking about has a constituency, has a way to measure success. It is relevant and timely to the community, and people understand if they invest in it what they're going to get out of it. We've created a program called Kids in Need. And it's a big store with school supplies. You'd say, well, why school supplies in a food bank? Same kids from the same families never have those school supplies. It's a product that there's a lot of waste. This year, we're going to help over 2,500, up to close to 3,000 individual teachers. And we have a store about the size of this room with brand new school supplies and teachers can come in and shop. Okay? So we're in eight school systems now, 298 schools, and it's a free school supply for school teachers. If any of you are thinking about being school teachers, you have to buy your own supplies nowadays. They don't supply your classroom. You've got to buy them yourself. So who's the constituency? Why would we do a school supply program at the food bank? All right, you guys are going to have to help me out here. Or I'm just talking to myself. Think about school supplies. Who's a constituency? Teachers? Students? Principals? PTAs? All the volunteers at school? I mean, think about that. That's thousands of people that are thinking very well of the food bank. They all are potential vo uh, donors. They're all potential volunteers. They're all potential helping me find these supplies. We only handle new stuff. So when you go in, it's like we're walking into Office Depot. We've tracked sh trade shows at the World Congress Center when they have office and school supply shows and have gotten five, six, seven tractor trailer loads of brand new school supplies out of a trade show. Now why can I get into the World Congress Center with security badges? Why? Because I have Atlanta's table. I know that industry and they trust me. Okay? So they let us in. That's connected to that. Our product rescue center, we use over a thousand volunteers a month. We take volunteers as young as eight years old so that families can come together. So again, groups come together. So we have a lot of uh, university students come down. Now you come down on a Friday night, volunteer, and then go out and have a beer and pizza or whatever. You know, it's a social experience. You're doing real good. We measure what we do. We translate it into the number of families we serve so you feel like it's a meaningful experience. <clears throat> we created a program called the Prosperity Campaign. And there we're helping working people with their taxes and with earned benefits. Okay? So if you make less than a certain amount, this year I think it's $42,000 with a family of four, if you make less than that, you get an earned benefit. You get a, a tax return. Okay? Either you may not know about it or you're going to pay a tax service a lot of money to do that work. I've got 60 sites around the city run by volunteers. This year, or this last year, we're in the middle of tax season now, we brought in over $18 million back to the community. Now, which industries are paying those wages? Hospitality industry, the food industry, healthcare industry, and retail. Okay? Wow, those are, the, those are the industries I'm working with. So I could go to the hotel council, right, and say, we've got a deal for you. All your employees that are eligible for this, we'll do their taxes for free. You can tell them it was your idea. You're giving them a pay raise. Okay? So, each of these stories, I'm making a connection for you. Why there's a constituency out there, what we need to do to do that program. And of course, we've done earned benefits around food stamps and, and other earned benefits. We've got the technology to do all that now. 
So as I think about the things that has made the food bank successful, one is if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be a good communicator. You've got to have passion for what you do. You've got to work in the context of community. This work will burn you out otherwise. And even if you're going to go in the business world, it'll burn you out if you don't work in the context of community and have support. You've got to be able to facilitate problem solving. And I know you go through college and don't take a communication course, a facilitation course. I think you can get out of management school without taking those courses. I can tell you that, that having those skill sets would be some of the most important skill sets that you would have as a leader in the community. You've got to, as I ask in my early days, what was I willing to give my life to? You've got to reframe the question and say, what am I willing to live for? Okay? And when you ask that larger question, not what am I willing to die for, dying is easy. Living is harder. You find that out as you get older, that you've got to keep studying, you've got to exercise, you've got to stay healthy, you've got to eat right, you've got to surround yourself with other people. So to be a leader, you've got to have those basic, basic commitments, so you might even call them basic disciplines. Go forward. Tell me what time we are so that I know... Because I can talk for hours. Okay, so uh, another few minutes. Okay. Well, I'm a little worried you guys are going to do Q and A with me since you hadn't answered my question so far. But I'm giving you five minutes notice here. I'm going to go back to the point that I just made about having passion and commitment for the work. I grew up overconfident, asking inappropriate questions, but underneath being very shy. Now, I know I'm up here giving in a lecture, and I give them all the time now. Basically, I'm a shy person. So. As I got into my work, actually, I, I got a teaching degree. This was an indication of how I can finagle things. I remember I was so afraid to get in front of my class, and this is in college, to do student teaching that I figured out to go to a president of a university and tell him I wanted to be his assistant for a semester if he would sign off that I was a, a student teacher. And he agreed. And I followed this guy around for a whole semester. So. I could not speak. I could not articulate ideas until I had a passion for it, until it was something that I was so full of, so committed to, that I felt like I had something to share. So doing your interior work, which I know is not the reason you came to the university. You're here to, to learn the technical parts about management. But doing your interior work and knowing who you are and what you can commit yourself to and what you can sustain over time, I think will be essential to your success. So let me stop there and see what kind of questions you might have on your mind. I, I can answer any technical things about running nonprofits or about leadership or about my own journey. Anybody? Uh, at what point do you feel like you answered the questions, what could you die for, or what could you live for? Well, I answered the question uh, uh, probably in that uh, first two years of my work, that I knew this is what I wanted to devote myself to. I have to say that I didn't have a lot of support from my family or from other people saying, Bill, you're living in community. I lived in community, my wife and I did, for 10 years. We didn't own any property. You know, I'm getting up in my mid-30s with two children, and we're still in this communal setting. So you know, I didn't have a great life plan of this is how I'm going to uh, you know, take care of my responsibilities.
but I did have a plan of this is what I want to devote my life to. I don't think you have to have a moral cause or you have to work in the nonprofit sector. I mean, I think you can be an engineer or a scientist or a manager. And if you do that well, you can bring something along or whatever the process or whatever the product is. But I think the question is important. The question about what are you willing to live for is a deeper, harder question. And that really is where you grapple with, I want to do this all the time, but I need to stop and exercise, or I need to stop and take time to be with my family, or I need to stop and go back to school and study, and, uh, or I need to learn these processes. And what I really want to do is just go out there and feed folks. Okay? So there's a discipline here that I'm suggesting that gets harder as you go along. It gets easier as far as you knowing for sure that's it. But it gets harder in that everything I've talked about, starting with a pickup truck and a, you know, and a little room in the basement, I've had to learn logistics. I've had to learn inventory control. I've had to, I got a fleet of trucks out there. You know, last year, Walmart came to us finally and said, we want to donate everything out of our stores. Okay? Now, they got 87 stores in the Atlanta area. Their commitment was to the environment, not to hungry people. They're a big environmental leader, like it or not. I mean, they're, they're building their stores. They're experimenting with a lot of things. They said, we're not going to throw anything away. Now, this was a national commitment. They said, well, great, give us your dump bill, and we'll take care of all that stuff. No, they weren't going to give us all the money for the dump bill. They just wanted us to pick up the food. We got to pick up the food three days a week with a trained staff in a truck that's refrigerated with their <coughs> branded containers. We've got to bring that, separate it out, and get it distributed out. We're going to handle about 4 million pounds of food from retailers. Because Kroger came on, we're doing about 50 of their stores. Publix just came in here last week and said, I got about 140 some stores. So this is the new movement in retail, that we will pick up all retail stores. So you're thinking, I mean, think to yourself. All of a sudden, I've got 350 stores to pick up. I've, you know, I'm used to going with my big truck to the warehouse to pick up things, but now I've got to figure out where all those stores are, get there at the appointed time with a trained person, get that stuff out of there, and get to the next store. Let's think about how you would handle that. I don't know how to do this. Okay? Here's another hint. Look around and say, who knows the most about that? Who is the best in town at that? Who would you say? Who's great in logistics in town, transportation? UPS? Whoa. They don't even take left turns, do they? Huh? Coca-Cola? 800 trucks out on the road every day. Cisco Foods? Fresh Point? I got all those folks on my board. I said, I want to meet. I want you to teach me how to do this. It took us about four months of meetings with all these folks around the table. They're best logistics people. We actually convinced UPS to give us their software. We don't do left turns either. Okay? Now, this is a point where you've got to be able to change and learn all the time. Even if you're successful, you've got to be willing to embrace change because change will come. You're, you're always trying to get better. So some opportunity presents itself, usually as a problem. This is another one. You think about problems as opportunities. They asked me for a title of my talk today, and it was being overwhelmed with opportunity. Because you know, when people ask how I'm doing, that's usually what I say. I'm overwhelmed with opportunity, because my God, there's a lot of problems out there right now. So you know, that's an example of where you take a problem or an issue and make it into an opportunity, and then you figure out, how do I get help learning how to do that? So as a leader, you've got to constantly do that all the time. And you're always looking. It's always good to have mentors. It's always good to look to folks who have succeeded. Some of them have written books. Some of them, you know, aren't known at all. You have to go out and seek them. Another example, we wanted to do great customer service at the food bank. I'm talking about it and talking about customer service, and I realize, you know, it ain't going to happen, me just telling people we need to do good customer service. 
There's a thing in, in, in management called the Malcolm Bowage Award. It's for the best customer service. Who gets that? Ritz Carlton. I marched myself down to Ritz Carlton. I said, well, maybe an odd request. I want you to train my staff in the Ritz Carlton way. I think they were it was such an audacious ass, they said yes. If you don't ask, you don't know, right? And that's how we learn. If you don't ask questions in class, if you don't ask questions of your colleagues, in particular when you become a professional, you've got to ask questions. You might get a lot of no's, or I don't have time to do that, or this is not an appropriate ask for me. You just go to the next person and ask that question. Um, not, not too much of a segue from your last topic, but you said your mission was uh, engage, educate, and empower community in hunger. Yet to you, fight hunger. And to fight hunger. Yet you've started to, to branch out into taxation and into working with schools, and it sounds like gardening also. So I was just curious about how you take your mission at the Atlanta, community, uh, the Atlanta Food Bank and then start to go off into those different directions, or at least, at least how that it maybe is incorporated with your mission or I mean, how you define yourself. Okay. Well, just as a... Uh, not to put you too much on the spot, but what do you think? I mean, where, where do you see the connection? Uh, I think by hunger you might mean disparity or maybe have a, a different definition of what hunger is. Than well, when, you, when you're fighting hunger, you, you realize that uh, in, in the United States, unlike maybe some other places in the world, 20% of what we grow and package is unmarketable in our country. 20%. Some of it gets plowed under in the fields. You know, it's underfill, overfill, it's a, you know, wrong size, wrong label, new flavor, whatever it is. You know, 95% of new products that come on the market every year, that new taste of Triscuit, don't make it. I mean, I get calls on that. Remember, uh, you know, when they had ketchup and, and squeeze bottles? They used to not have that. That was such a good idea. Then they put mayonnaise in it. You can't get mayonnaise out of those squeeze bottles. I remember when we got a lot of that donated. So, I mean, there's a lot of product out there, right? But you have to think, if the issue is not about food, but we still have hungry people, then what's the issue? The issue is poverty. Now, we're fighting hunger, but what we're doing is fighting poverty. So when you think about how do we fight poverty, how do we get the things to people that they need? If you've earned that income, and, I mean, this was started under a Republican administration when we had welfare reform. If, you know, the earned income tax credit. It's to say we want to reward those people that get up and go to work every day but don't make very good wages. We want to reward them and encourage them to work by giving them a tax credit. A lot of people don't even know about it. So any way I can encourage that, $18 million worth this last year, then I'm fighting hunger, right? School supplies, same kids come from the same families that may not have enough for food. Certainly didn't. never had a new box of crayons, never had the right pencils. We've even tested schools now that are getting school supplies from us and test scores went up by having all the supplies that they needed. I mean, a pretty basic thing. So my mission, and I think you're catching on to this, my mission is very broad. I mean, my gosh, everything fits under engaging, educating. <laughs> And empowering, doesn't it? You know, so I just need to make the case of the, the, it's out there. One thing you always have to ask if you're in a business and you see a new business opportunity is you never go out and survey the community. Churches do this all the time, or congregations. They'll decide they want to help, and they'll survey the community and say, oh, it came back that we should have after-school programs, and we should do feeding, and we should do... They never survey themselves to say, do we know how to do any of that? And they fail. So it's not a matter of knowing. There's plenty of need out there. It's a matter of knowing what your assets, what your core competencies are. So nonprofits are really bad at this because they see a new opportunity. So handling school supplies or garden supplies or, or any of that, that's my competency. I know how to do warehousing, trucking, logistics, so I could do any. Anything, like we handle a lot of non-food items at the food bank. You know, if you're on food stamps, you can't buy any hygiene items. You can't buy Pampers, Huggies for your baby. 
Uh, you know, you can't buy any paper products, no cleaning supplies. So, you know, those are things people need. So, you know, we try to get them. So, good question, but I think you always need to think as broad as you can, but then bring it back and focus. Is that our core competency? Do we know how to do that? Is it measurable? Is it meaningful? The other part I hadn't talked a lot about is how do we raise $16.5 million every year? you got to have a lot of folks out there that's going to support you. Our largest source of income is not the government, get very little government money because politics change, not foundations, although we do get foundation money, not even corporate money. It's individuals giving us small amounts, thousands of people. You know, just give us, give us what you can. Give me $20, multiply that by eight. You know, that's actually a quite a nice donation. So a lot of what we do is around building constituency out there that will support our work. And again, this is true in for-profit or not-for-profit. You've got to know who your customers are, who your constituency is. Yes. Um, what percentage, what percentage um, of your employees are volunteers and what percentage uh, are paid? And how, how do you fund those, those wages you have? Well, that's part of that, uh, you know, that's part of that budget. Uh, you know, our largest uh, expense is employees. I mean, you know, for me, it's just trucking, warehousing, and employees. But so I use 1,000, 1,200 volunteers a month. That's 28 staff people. I've got about 120 uh, professional staff people on staff. Some of them are kind of entry-level people working in the warehouse, and some folks have PhDs. It's a real variety of people. A lot of the things that people do at the food bank, you can learn. I mean, if you're smart and you work hard and you've got good values, you can learn that. But I do need somebody who knows accounting. I need somebody who knows technology. You know, logistics is getting to be a bigger and bigger part of our work. So I've got to start hiring specialists for that. Uh, I hope you're asking, thinking about, boy, the food bank would be a great place to work because I'm looking. That's why I come to these things. I'm looking for young people just like yourself. If there's ever a time, and I know you think, God, there's no jobs out there, and I better stay in school as long as I can, but if there's ever a time to be a leader, to step up, to give some meaning and some definition to the times that we're in, it is now. I mean, it is just, it is just wide open. Uh, I, I want to be as encouraging as I can in that way. At the food bank, we pay competitive wages. It's not as much as you're going to make working for a, you know, a Georgia Pacific or an IBM or uh, maybe even a Georgia Power, but it is competitive to other public service jobs, to other nonprofits. Um, and you've got to do that because this is a profession. I, you know, most of my management teams have been with me for over 20 years. So this is what they do. So just talk about the challenges of managing a volunteer workforce. Taking 1,200 people and making 28 out of them has got to be a challenge. Well, it is. And um, <laughs> uh, volunteers are very, uh, you, know, you know, it's just like a, a, a group, maybe a fraternity here at Tech would say, oh, yeah, we'll be over there with 30 people on Thursday night. 12 of you show up. Well, I've already staffed up, you know, for 30. So you've cost me money right away. So I need to know, is 30 going to be there? So a good volunteer program is going to know who's coming, how many. We're probably going to check with you twice before you get there, probably the day before. I mean, it, it, it's a no joke. You're either going to come or you're not going to come, and how many is going to be there? When you get there, I can tell you how many times you go out and volunteer, and you get there, and they'll go, oh, God, I forgot, I forgot you were coming, or I forgot so many people were coming. Just sit over there, and let's find something to do. Right there you go, I should not be here. These people do not need me. You come to the food bank, we're ready for you by name. We know your group. If there's a history of you coming, we'll say that. So we're going to come in, and we're going to collect your data, Right? Your phone number and your email and, and whatever we can collect so we can communicate to you again. And you're going to go through a training. And we're going to answer every question about what we're going to ask you to do before we put you to work, no matter how long it takes. Got a neat story. Our training video was actually done by the Cartoon Network. 
And we went to the car. You know, I thought, well, who, who can do this? Uh, I actually met the president of the cartoon network at a function, started talking to him, and he started telling me about, you know, man, we all used to do the creative work, and now we're all in management. We don't get to do the fun stuff anymore. I thought, well, gosh, I can give you something to do. Why don't you guys do a training video for you? I want the management team to do it. They did it. They're in it. They wrote the whole script, wrote the music and everything. But we, so we have a training video for you. Then we're going to have you work for about an hour and a half. One of the neat things about the food bank is that we have to throw away chocolate. Too bad, isn't it? Because if chocolate's not kept in the right temperature, it'll turn white on you. Still tastes all right, but the people that make the chocolate don't want you to see that, right? So they have to throw it away. So good deal to food bank. You get to eat all the chocolate you want while you're there. <laughs> so we work for about an hour and a half. We'll take a little break. It's great to give middle schoolers chocolate. You know, on break, and they work, work really good second shift. <laughs> I don't know what happens to their parents after we send them home. But, but uh, So we are going to measure what you did in pounds. Competition's good. We might actually tell you that Georgia State was down here last week and broke the records. I don't know if you guys are any good or not. We usually get working pretty good. We're going to measure that. We're going to translate it into how many families are fed, and we're going to tell you something about where that food is going. And if you would like a different volunteer experience, we'll set you up to volunteer in an agency where that food's going. So. If you miss any of those steps, and of course you thank people many times and ask them to come back, but you've got to do all those steps just like any business. You've got to communicate well, make people feel safe and trained. It's got to be meaningful work, measurable, and translatable into something that makes sense to us. I was just wondering about, like, with the current economic recession, um, if you notice any trends in more more food consumption and trends in less donations of food and money and and the like, what you think? <laughs> well, you know it's tractable because we we have a saying at the food bank: things that get counted get done. So we we count a lot of stuff there. We count all our processes. Any good business does. In the last two years, we're up 75%. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I've been doing this work for 35, 36 years. I've never seen it like this. 20% of the people that are coming in to ask for emergency food report that they've never asked before. That's humbling. 50% of the people coming in to ask and it may be a congregation for food, report that they're working but not making enough. Usually they don't have health care or affordable housing. So when we think about, and we are in very challenging times as a, as a city, as a region, as a state, as a country. I mean, the state's looking at over $2 billion they got to cut. I've just spent the last five days in Washington doing lobbying around policy. So, you know, things are going to be fundamentally different in your life than they were for me when I was your age. It's going to be fundamentally different. But when you look at challenges and problems as opportunities, what do you say? Wow, we're overwhelmed with opportunity, aren't we? I mean, this is a good time. It's a good time in the sense that if you are managing well, if you communicate well, if you can measure what you're doing, and it's actually having an impact that people say that's a good impact, then you're going to get more support. Because when you have less dollars and there's more competition for them, those, those organizations, and I'll tell you, you know, transparency and consistency always win, no matter whether what sector you're in in business. Trans, uh, be, being uh, so that people can see exactly what you're doing, you can go to my website, See our 990s, you can see you know, our mission, all our programs, you, all the measures, it's, it's all there. Annual reports on the website. So it is a challenge right now because our budget's going up, the work is going up. On the other hand, we're best in class. So the big challenge for us, quite frankly, is what about those 700 organizations out there? 
because we exist to serve them. They don't exist so we can work, right? Just so uh, we can be there. They, we exist for them. They're our customers. So we have spent the last year and a lot of work going out, and we've had forums. We're in 38 counties. We had 29 forums, brought all our agencies together, uh, and asked them, how are you doing? What do you need? What could we do better? Now, that, that was a lot of time out when we could be working, just having that conversation. But very, very important time, you know, because now we know what they need. I don't think demand is going to go down anytime soon. It all comes back to jobs. And as I go out and talk to folks about fighting hunger, you know a way to fight hunger? Get people work. Not jobs that don't pay, but jobs that pay a living wage. If you're going to do that, the real issue then is education. Right? I mean, it all comes back to education. But if you're going to try to address education, then you've got to start looking at schools. If you're going to look at schools, you start looking at neighborhoods. You start looking at neighborhoods, you start looking at family structure. So everything is connected to everything else in that way. And I think it's incumbent on us who are leaders in this sector to, to say that, not to just talk about our little piece, but to talk about there are many ways to fight hunger. You can be an educator, you can be an advocate, you can be a service provider. You can go out and make a lot of money and give me some, right? I mean, it, it, it's all connected. The best companies, I'll tell you, and, and there's a lot of good ones in Atlanta, but the best companies are very clear about their values and make it very easy for employees to get involved in community. And I can tell you, if you're going to get into management, and into top management, you will have to get involved in, in your congregation, in your rotary, in your, uh, uh, in your professional associations. That's what distinguishes you, not just how well you did in your job, but how you're involved in community. Okay. There. Um, <laughs> For you, uh, what has been the most challenging thing um, for the startup of Atlanta Food Bank and also getting people to be on board with you when there wasn't such a large return on investment? Well, I think um, y you know, I think it's uh, and it's kind of incumbent when we when we're starting things uh, is you really don't know how they're going to turn out. So, so there's, a, 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 there's a fear of failure. I don't know how to say it. But can I sustain this over time? So one of the real key components of being a leader is you've got to be passionate, you've got to believe in what you're saying, and it's got to be reflected in your life, not just in your theory. You've got to be a good communicator. You've got to be a good persuader. You've got to persuade people to join you in this. So when I started, I started out with two volunteers from the community kitchen who I said, well, if you don't want to serve any food, come over here and help us out in the warehouse. I mean, you know, so the first three people I hired at the food bank, I promised them $10,000 a year, no benefits, because we didn't have any benefits then, all the food they could eat, and I didn't pay myself the first two years. Because I, I worked for the church and then ran the food bank after I got off. So, you know, you hear those stories of starting with nothing and so forth. Uh, you know, everybody didn't have to start that way. But you always have to start, I think, if you've got a new idea and you've got to convince people to do it, they've got to be convinced that you're convinced and that every fiber in you is, is going to be committed to this thing. I didn't know for some time that I could, uh, you know, I could raise a family, you know, that I could carry on my responsibilities as, as an adult. Uh, you know, I just didn't know how all of that was going to work in the beginning. But I did know this is what, in, in the sense for me, what God had called me to do was to serve, to be a servant leader. I don't know if you've, stu you've, you've studied different leadership styles. Uh, but a servant leader, I mean, there's collaborative leaders. There's all kind of different leadership styles, and you probably read all those books. But a servant leader, 
Uh, there's a great gentleman, Robert Greenleaf, back in the 60s, who, who had been an ATT employee for 30 years, retired, and started writing about servant leadership. So the Greenleaf Center exists, and I, I'd encourage you to read about this. But the way you measure a servant leader is not what they did. You measure the people around them. And if the people around a servant leader are, are more educated, more empowered to do the work, if they're charged up to go, then that servant leader did their job. Okay? So that's what I've tried to do, is to draw people and organizations and corporations and, and the public sector you know, to this cause. And I've done it by saying, I can show you a business proposition too. I can show you how this is good for your business, it's good for society, and it's good for the people we're serving. So you've got to create win-win-win. Yes. I would like to know if people can come as individuals and get food at the uh, warehouse, or do you only distribute food through your network? In, in our model, we only serve organizations. Uh, we have organizations very close by, so we do have individuals that come. And we can just say, you know, right, a few blocks down the street, they're prepared to see you. And if you can be anywhere in Georgia, call me up and tell me your zip code, and I can tell you where those organizations are to serve. And we do get a lot of those calls. Uh, and a lot of people are, are in a temporary bind. Some people, you know, need permanent help. But here, if you're working at that community level, and that's where I began. I worked six years, you know, working with homeless and street people. The food, and, I, and, and maybe I should have said this earlier, the way we think about the food, all 28 million pounds of it, the way we think about the food is a, is a tool, is a vehicle to use. Because where the work is being done is where that person says, I need food, and a person says, let's talk. And let's figure out what your story is. Because it might be, I can help you get a job. Maybe you need more education. Maybe you've got a you know, some kind of domestic violence situation going on in your family. You know, there's a lot of those kind of issues. Food is the thing we have a surplus of in society. Shortage of health care, shortage of housing, you know, a, a shortage of all kinds, shortage of school supplies for kids. We got food, though. So we use that food as a transformative tool. And that really is, at the end of the day, the way we think about this. So if I'm doing two million more pounds, that's two million more stories that we might hear and, and figure out how do we help people. I was just wondering um, where uh, you guys go into new ventures all the time, or you've said several, and then where do these ideas come from? Do you guys have committees? Do you just listen to staff? Do you have a little box for new ideas? And then you seem to have so much to manage already when you come up with these new ideas, do you have people that go off and tell you about them, or do you lead them yourself and then give them off to other people? Yes. <laughs> yes to all your questions. That was uh, <laughs> you know, um, if you're a social entrepreneur, you do see opportunity everywhere. You know, for instance, uh, if I go into a restaurant or a hotel, or I even come here at Georgia Tech, uh, I look around and see how things work. I mean, I'm, ju I'm just that kind of guy. And I'm usually not looking at the top guy, I'm looking at the bottom guy. Uh, so having those kind of eyes to see, and it's something you train yourself for. But if you have eyes for opportunity, you'll see opportunity. I don't come up with every idea, but I do, I do uh, identify ideas. Now, as a, as a leader, I don't always know what to do with the idea. What I tend to do, and this is, I'm just saying for me, I don't think there's anything you read in a textbook, but if I have an idea, I usually talk about it for a while. I bring it up in conversation almost as if we're going to do it. I have no idea if we're going to do it, but I just start, you know, mentioning it and somebody will give me some ideas or did you know? And then the second thing I do is I start spotting someone to lead that idea. 
if it's in my organization. Either somebody already working for me, or I'm always looking out for talent. Okay? So usually at the level that I hire anymore, because I've got managers and I've got a COO, and you know, it's a big organization. Uh, I'm not hiring every single person anymore. But we should never be caught short. If we see something coming and think in six months we're going to need this, start looking now. <laughs> have that person identified. You know, have some people in your pocket and say, you know, if the right idea comes, I know that's the kind of leader I want. I will say that my staff occasionally contracts with me not to bring any more new ideas to them. It's like, Bill, we can't do any more ideas. So you've really got to measure, is it the right time for that idea? Is it, does it play to our core competency? Do we think there's a constituency out there that wants us to succeed? Can we raise money for it? Is there a way to measure if we do it whether and, and translate it into something the community understands? Does it fit within my mission? I've got a broad mission, but it's still got to fit. It's either engaging, educating, or empowering in some kind of way. So you go through all those processes. And I don't necessarily have a checklist and, you know, with 28 things and I check them, but I'm always doing that in my mind. It's, it's an intuitive thing. I, another thing I'll mention, and this is just something that I, I guess, developed when I was working uh, in working with the homeless, is that I discovered um, I had, um, I don't know how to say this, but, but like a, kind of a psychic ability to, to see the best in people instead of the worst. I, I, you know, you can see a person that's in their worst state. They're addicted or they're, you know, they got in trouble somehow, whatever. And I had the gift of being able to see the possibility in that person. Doesn't always work out. But having that, it, it really helps in identifying, you know, talent and, and connecting talent to ideas. So I think to be in this work, you've got to basically believe that most people want to do the right thing. That most people are good. In the society that we live in right now, and what you mostly see on news and entertainment is how can we scare the heck out of you? How can we build more fear for the other? Whether the other person's a different color, nationality, different religion, it's all around fearing the other. Now, the great thing about your generation is you can cut right through that because you have the technology. That's how the revolutions are, are uh, happening in the Middle East right now. And they're going to continue to happen around the world. We can't stop them because people have access to information. But you've got to access the best part of yourself, of not just the information out there, but the best part of what you know in yourself. And if you can access that and look out and see the possibilities instead of the negativities, see the opportunities instead of problems, if you can see the best in people and what, if you could just create the right situation, they would step up and do their best work, then it's your job as a leader to create that situation. And they will do their best work. Bill, uh, you and your organizations have certainly made an impact in this community and across the country. And thanks for coming out to Georgia Tech today. Sure. Thank you.